Uh, we're delighted to have the mayor of Phoenix, Greg Stanton, here to help us kick off the morning. Mayor Stanton was born in this town. He's passionate about making Phoenix work for everyone who calls it home. He's here to talk with my colleague, Atlantic Senior Editor, Ron Brownstein. Ron, take it away. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor. Good morning. Thank, thank you for being here. Uh, I think we're going to... Uh, think about this conversation in concentric circles, moving from the local to kind of the state uh, to the national, and, and starting out right here in Phoenix. After a wobble around the Great Recession, you are growing again and growing fast. I think you ranked uh, eighth among all uh, metro areas in, in the growth from 2010 to 2015. And I've seen projections that over the next 30 years or so, you will add a population the size of Denver in this in this area, I, and I would advise you to import the brew pubs if you do that. <laughs> um, but um, uh, uh, as you add these new people, will as Phoenix and the region continues to grow, will it simply be enlarging what we see now, or will they be growing into a city that looks very different than it does today? It has to look different, and ha we have to improve upon what we've done in the past. <clears throat> look, you welcome to long-range trend lines, the fastest growing big city in the United States of America post-World War II. The recession hit us harder than any other big city in the United States of America. Economy is heading in the right direction now, and we are growing fast uh, again. But overall, our economy in the past has been too tied to simply growth for growth's sake. Mm -hmm. We are, in so many ways, the poster child for suburban sprawl uh, America. We're also the poster child for a city that can renewal and get it right moving forward. We have to build a more innovative economy. We have to build a more export-based uh, economy. We have to be as attractive as possible for our young people growing up here who want to stay here and have their lives and careers. We want to be as attractive as possible for people who are moving from other parts of the country, voting with their feet, if you will, to, mm -hmm. to, our, to our city. Look, I would politely argue that there is not a more important indicator of the future success of the United States of America than Phoenix, Arizona, because of our diverse population, our fast-growing population. We're not tied to any old industry. If we can get it right, if we can build the kind of economy built to last that works for everyone here in Phoenix, uh, then the United States of America can be strong so, in the future. So walk me through some of the ways in which this growth, the city may look different at the end of this growth spurt than it does today after the last growth spurt. Well, we are urbanizing at an incredible uh, pace. Our downtown, the center city, where we're sitting here right now mm -hmm. in the heart of our uh, city, already looks incredibly different. Over the next decade or so, it's going to look unbelievably uh, different. People are voting with their feet to move to the center part uh, of the city. The city has invested a huge amount of resources uh, to facilitate that development, but we are hyper-urbanizing right now, faster than the parts of the country, but in so many ways, we had more catching up uh, uh -huh. to do. For so long, people thought that in Phoenix, people didn't want to live a more urban uh, lifestyle. They came from other cities where it was urban, they wanted to get away from that. The truth is that we just didn't really offer that, that lifestyle as an option. Once you offer it, the people come, and they're coming in droves in Phoenix, Arizona. We're going through a record pace of, of uh, new residences being built, condos, apartments, et cetera, all over the uh, city. Is it, is it generational? I mean, is it, is it, is it a, a preference for kind of an urban, an urban experience among younger generations, or are you seeing it cross-generations? It is cross-generation. Uh, I know the stereotype, if you will, is that it's the millennials that want to live in the center Until city. 32. Uh, and, <laughs> and that's happening here. But a huge part of it is empty nesters, mm -hmm. people that love to go to the symphony, ballet, opera, first Fridays on a, uh, one of our great art walks on a Friday night. And instead of having to drive long distances, they can walk or bike to those great amenities. So as much as anything, it's multi-generational, and that's great for the city of Phoenix. You know, one of, the, one of the central themes we're exploring as we go to cities around the country is how communities are organizing to respond to the challenges they face. And I think one of the most interesting examples of a community taking affirmative action to really set a long-term vision is your Transportation 2050 plan and the tax increase that voters here approved uh, last year to fund that for literally decades. Um, what was the coalition? I mean, we don't think of Arizona you know, as a, as a high-tax state that is, that is kind of in the, in, in the blue state model of high-tax High service. What was the coalition that came together that allowed you to pass that? First off, we prefer the term strategic investment uh, <laughs> rather than uh, tax increase. Yeah, yeah. But uh, whatever you call it, yeah. it's great for the future of our uh, of our city. Look, the reality is is that years ago when we first passed a revenue source for transportation in the city of Phoenix, that's where we got the initial 22 or 23 mile existing uh, light rail line and improved bus service. People argued they won't use it. Don't vote for this, they won't use it. 
Well, that argument's gone. People have used it and used it overwhelmingly. People of all socioeconomic uh, backgrounds, which has been great for the, uh, uh, for the city. And the direct connection between um, transportation investment and education. I mean, for our urban public high school, our transportation system is the public transportation system, the school Ooh. transportation system for then. You want to get students to ASU downtown, which is up to 17,000 students that didn't even exist 10 years ago, and get from the Tempe campus to the downtown uh, campus, almost 25% of the rides are education related. So never discount the relationship between transportation investment and trying to have greater educational achievement in your community. We made that connection, which meant that not only was it the business community that supported it, and they did, but it was neighborhoods from all over the city, all different socioeconomic backgrounds. In fact, for the light rail portion of it, the first line that's gonna be built yep. under this new investment is gonna be in South Phoenix, yep. which is one of the poor parts of the city with the highest percentage of Latino and African Americans. And, and, we wanna make sure that everyone has the benefit of these investments. And I wanna ask you about that because in other cities that we've been in, <clears throat> that, that has been something of a two-edged sword. On, on the one hand, uh, residents of those communities have often felt that they are underserved by public transportation. On the other hand, there has been a concern in some cities that, that dense development that follows uh, public transportation will lead to displacement. The density equals displacement. Are you worried about that in South Phoenix, and how do you combat it, if so? Well, let me tell you a couple things. First, uh, yes, uh, the, the certainly feeling it's been <laughs> accurate, because when we did the first round of light rail, we did pass over South Phoenix, and in fact, in the, the Washington funding systems created a perverse disincentive mm. to skip over poor neighborhoods across the United States of America because you got credit for federal funding by the number of people, number of cars you would take off the road, wow. not the number of people you utilize. So areas that already he were heavy users of public transportation didn't get the new investment. That was a mistake. It was corrected during the Obama administration. We sold it in Phoenix as what an incredible opportunity for all people, including especially the people of South Phoenix, to get on that light rail and be able to get easy access to employment centers, higher education opportunities, our great community colleges, uh, high schools, uh, et cetera. And, by the way, a great opportunity for the people from all across the valley to get to South Phoenix, yeah. which is one of the coolest areas of our city, most our most diverse area with great cultural amenities, great restaurants, et cetera. So people to discover South Phoenix. And of course, we're gonna have gentrification discussions and debates. And there are gonna be some tough discussions about the type of development that we wanna see around light rail. But transportation is not just about getting people from point A to point B, it's also about the economic development opportunities. And I don't want South Phoenix or any other part of the city to miss out on the great urban renewal type projects like right here at the Newton and Central Phoenix, which is only here in part because of the investment. So you made expect development rail. dollars to follow, to follow the rail? If you build it, they will come. Without a doubt. Yeah. I mean, we already on our existing light rail line, eight billion dollars of public and private in investment. Uh, the investment community follows where you make those fixed route uh, decisions. And I know, that, by the way, the people who opposed uh, the election last year—it was a year ago, uh, this time of year—that we overwhelmingly passed our transportation investment uh, uh, project. It wasn't that people weren't going to use it. It was, well, what about driverless cars? What about Uber and Lyft? If that's going to negate the need for this type of transportation projects. And my response was, a great city provides all kinds of transportation options. You're a walkable city. You're a bikeable city. Uh, you have a, a much improved bus system. You do dial a ride to support people who happen to have uh, disabilities. And you support Uber and Lyft and driverless cars. So, Those are not the opposite of each other. They support each so other. So in your mind, uh, <clears throat> is improving public transportation options fundamentally a matter of quality of life, moving cars off the road, reducing congestion, or is it intrinsically interwoven in uh, diversifying the economy? Do, do you need a more of a, you know, a more walkable, bikeable, public transportable city in order to create a more diversified economy? Do the two go together in your mind? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not one or the other. Or the other. It, it, it absolutely goes uh, directly uh, uh, hand in hand. And look, our largest employer, Banner Health, the largest employer in the state of Arizona, just decided to move their corporate headquarters to be right on the light rail uh, line. The decision of Arizona State University to mm -hmm. continue to uh, invest in our uh, downtown in partnership with the city is directly related to our investments in 
uh, light rail and uh, public transport. But don't underestimate buses too, by the yep. way. We just announced last week mm. that our buses are gonna go from 4 a.m. to midnight, which is huge for working families across the city. Second shifters can now take the bus where it, it before that uh, stopped at 10 p.m. And we're gonna do that on the weekends in the next few months as well. So we're actually making massive improvements to our bus system as well, and which is actually where the bulk of people that utilize public transportation uh, take advantage of. What will be the biggest drivers of employment growth in Phoenix in the next 15 or 20 years, and how does it differ from what you've seen over the last 15 or 20? Well, the, the, the biggest driver of employment <coughs> growth is really going to be a, dis, a collective decision in our community whether we're really going to invest in education. I mean, make no mistake, transportation is going to be great. Our continued support for arts and culture and being an interesting place to live is incredibly important as we try to build a more innovative uh, economy, higher wage uh, jobs, support our startup economy and our innovation ecosystem. But make no mistake, uh, there ain't no substitute. Mm -hmm. I just said ain't, I talked about right. education. Right. I apologize. Right. My mom right. was an English teacher. Right. Mom, I'm so sorry. There isn't a substitute for greater financial support for a public education system. We have no choice as a community, as a state. You know, 2014 was a historic turning point uh, uh, or in the history of the country landmark where for the first time a majority of our public school students nationwide were kids of color. This is not, this is not new news in Phoenix. This is old news uh, in Phoenix. You have been dealing with this transition uh, for many years, but yet you're still facing stubborn gaps in educational attainment. I think the graduation rate of Maricopa County for African-American Hispanic students, about three quarters graduate on time compared to uh, I think 86% of whites, the NAEP score differentials. What have you learned about uh, what it takes to narrow some of these educational attainment gaps, and is the state and the city and the county sufficiently focused on doing so? Okay, well, the, the answer to the second question is no. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but, and you mentioned some of the uh, statistics relative yeah. to the population. In central Phoenix, and Phoenix Union High School District, which is our big urban high school district, almost 85% Latino. That's yeah. our future. Right. Now, that's been the source of great political debate. <clears throat> what should be our public policies vis-a-vis -vis our wonderfully diverse population? I take the position that that's our greatest strategic advantage. I mentioned earlier I want to build an innovative export-based economy. Mexico's already our number one trading partner, and yet we're way behind California and Texas. We got some catching up to do. Our Latino population is younger than average. It's bilingual. It's, as a population, it's very entrepreneurial. Um, with many already having family or friends relationships in Mexico, Central Latin America. That's a formula for great success in building an export-based economy. All we have to do is invest in the human capital that we are so blessed to have, and frankly, we haven't done so at the, at the appropriate levels here in our, uh, here in our uh, community. So obviously, we've got to work on making sure that we have the highest graduation rates possible, the highest rates of, of students moving on from high school to either college or career uh, programs or university, whatever is appropriate, but some positive path beyond uh, uh, high school to, to have them the careers that they uh, deserve to have. And that's our greatest challenge as a community. If we don't solve that issue, we're not gonna do well in the new competitive international economy. If we do solve that issue, Phoenix can be a leading economic city in this you, new economy moving forward. Because you are in a situation like many uh, fast growth cities where you have enormous success at attracting college graduates from elsewhere, from around the country, and around the world who move in yep. as you create more jobs, particularly as you're creating more tech jobs. But it has been much harder to put your own kids on a track to compete for the jobs that you are creating. John Hickenlooper, uh, who is now the governor of Colorado, used to be the mayor of Denver, calls this the Denver paradox. You know, the people come from all over the world for the jobs that we're creating, but kids who grow up in some of our uh, you know, less, le least advantaged neighborhoods, simply that, that development might, has been, might as well have been happening on the moon uh, from, from their perspective. Is that a sustainable model for a city like Phoenix to rely on importing talent, or do you have to figure out a way to put more of your own young people on a track for the jobs you're creating? I mean, the, the, the Denver paradox, you described it, yeah. could, is the Phoenix story uh, yeah. as well. Our economy is moving in a positive direction overall, but if we don't get that fundamental issue right that you just described, yeah. better support for the students that are going through the school system now better support for our diverse student population then simply we won't be we won't we won't have the opportunity to be success i mean demographics is destiny yeah. and that's a great opportunity for us but we have to treat it as this great opportunity and i think in arizona unfortunately 
we haven't, we haven't uh, done so as of yet. But when we do, I'm actually an optimist. I think we will. We're going to get it right. When we do, incredible economic opportunity for As a for mayor, our you have limited leverage over the school system. You focused on third grade reading proficiency as an area to try to, to, try to make a, a, a dent. Uh, how come and what are you doing there? As mayor, uh, as the city of Phoenix, we do not run public schools. Right. Let me thank the good Lord for that right mm. now. Thank God. Yeah. We don't, we, so that allows us to be uh, the very best partner to our public uh, schools. So it allows me to go to our school board members and our superintendents and say, tell me what I can do to support your uh, mission. And we've heard over and over again that third grade reading is the best thing yeah. we do. So we work with wonderful nonprofits like Experience Corps to bring in retired folks who are still incredibly talented and desiring to make a huge difference. And they work one on one with, um, uh, with our uh, students through our after school programs, through our public libraries, which are the hidden gems in the education system. We don't take nearly advantage of our public library system to support kids, particularly as it relates to uh, third grade reading. Obviously, we run a very large Head Start program with the with the uh, city of Phoenix. Don't ever underestimate how important it is to fully invest in Head Start, which hasn't happened yeah. nearly to the level that it, uh, that it should to help with this issue of the educational attainment uh, disparity. So it's a hugely important priority for us and it's the best thing that we can do to support our public schools is, in Phoenix. Is the state going to fund full day kindergarten statewide? Do you expect that to happen? Well, that's a very complicated uh, question. So the, I think the answer is yes, they will. But let's not pat ourselves on the back too much. You see, no state in the country has cut education funding more than the state of Arizona. So if they give a little bit of it back and only fund early childhood, or the, uh, the kindergarten program, but don't restore the other cuts, well, you're just moving money around. You haven't accomplished nearly as much as you, uh, you could. So we, that would be a good thing if we can fully fund all day K in the state of Arizona, but not to the exclusion of restoring the massive cuts that have done huge damage to the future of our state. One is not the opposite of the other. We can do both in the state of Arizona, and we have to do both. There are a number of cities, small but you know, steadily growing, San Antonio, New York, Denver, Seattle, Chicago, that have cobbled together the money to have universal pre-K within their city. Is that something that you can do at Phoenix, or have you basically used your big tax increase uh, chit on the long term of uh, transportation? Well, look, uh, what I have done <coughs> is try to be supportive of statewide uh, efforts. I did support Proposition 123. Uh, the governor and I yeah. actually were very closely together on supporting Proposition 123, which was a small plan in the right uh, direction. Now the question is really, what are we going to do next? My first preference is to, uh, is to work with business leadership which understands the need that we better support our public schools to do something on a larger level. If not, Phoenix will have to do something. There's no doubt about Phoenix it. Phoenix will do something. We have to do doesn't. something. We have to do something. Just like on transportation, if I had my druthers, we would have participated in a statewide transportation plan or a regional plan. The reality is, is that neither the state nor the county were prepared uh, to move forward with the transportation infrastructure uh, plan. Yeah. So I have a choice as a city. Do I wait around for them to do it or do I lead? Same thing with higher education, by the way. Phoenix lamented the lack of higher education opportunities in our city. We could wait around for the state legislature to fund Arizona State University in downtown or we could do it ourselves. We looked in the mirror as a city and said, we want to have greater college attainment in mm -hmm. our community. So the city funded the capital infrastructure for ASU downtown. The city was a financial partner when the U of A built a medical school in our downtown. So we have a unique role because we don't get quite the support that probably other communities do. And if we're gonna advance as a city, we gotta look in the mirror and say, we gotta do it. Yeah, so you know, speaking of that, speaking of relations with the state, a theme in a number of places we have been, Charlotte, Cleveland, has been conflict between cities that want to move in one direction and basically rural dominated state legislatures and governor coalitions that want to stop them. Uh, but of all the conflict that I have seen around the country, maybe SB 1847 here takes that to the max of what we have, uh, what we have witnessed in terms of this urban, uh, non-urban uh, conflict in, in state legislatures. How has that affected what you do in Phoenix and your ability to make your own choices? So SB 1487, of course, was the mother of all 
city preemption yeah. laws right. across the state of Arizona, yeah. which says that if a city adopts a policy that they allege goes against state policy, we will lose every dollar of state share revenue, which is 400 million dollars in the city of Phoenix that mostly goes to police officers and firefighters because that's the greatest percentage of our uh, budget. And oh, by the way, the decision maker is not a court of law, it's the attorney general. Mm -hmm. So we've, we actually lost out on due process to actually decide it's a crazy law, it's unconstitutional. We are uh, in the process of suing because as a city, that can't, uh, that can't stand. But it's the principle also. Look, as a city, we love the fact that for four years now, we've got a perfect score from the human rights campaign for our LGBT friendly public policies. Let's be honest, that's never gonna happen in the near future in the state of Arizona. In the city of Phoenix, we pass municipal ID so that all people living here, regardless of immigration status, can better access city services. You serve the people that live in your community. They're gonna, that's gonna blow their minds at the state legislature. I'm sure they're gonna try to preempt us or suggest that we lose out on state share revenue for a policy that supports uh, the people of this community. We're a, one of the, known as one of the most refugee friendly mm. communities, including for Syrian refugees. And obviously the governor issues, uh, he was among the many governors across the state that said that they wanted to stop refugees, the refugee program. What, what's coming. the time frame on that conflict over the municipal idea? What are you expecting to happen? Well, they're gonna try to preempt us, uh, which is what they do. Well, look, and the, and the, but the, the, the issue is this. Um, the people of Phoenix elected me and a majority of the council to adopt public policies that support the values of the people of the city of Phoenix. And do we really want a state representative from Lake Havasu City, a wonderful community by the way, but do we really want a state legislator from Lake Havasu City deciding public policies for what happens here in urban Phoenix? We're, our economy is doing great. Our unemployment rate is below the state average. The number of jobs and high wage jobs that are moving to Phoenix in part because of those progressive public policies that are, are advancing. Instead of preempting us, I suggest that our friends in the legislature learn from us, because what we're doing is working. And I tell them, if you are so interested in city policy and preempting city policy, what you ought to do is run for mayor. Mm -hmm. It's a great job. Don't go to the legislature and try to tell us what to do. And we can coexist side by side. If they leave us alone, let us adopt smart public policy for our city. They can adopt whatever public policy they think is appropriate for the state of Arizona. Just don't preempt us. We're doing great and let us uh, continue you doing what we're doing. You told me you are working with the mayor of Charlotte who finds herself in the same situation, obviously even more famously with HB2 uh, there. Uh, to, to organize, in effect, blue city mayors uh, who are living and operating in red states? I mean, what, what are the options available yes. for cities in your situation? We're not alone. Uh, there are a lot of cities across the country uh, in, in this exact situation. Oh, by the way, the new threat is gonna be well, federal yeah. policies to try to yeah. preempt uh, cities, to try to create this adversarial relationship. So it won't just be state legislators. And the mayors in similar circumstances who believe that passing smart economic policy, smart transportation policy, smart human rights policies helps to advance your economy, and they're all over the country. Uh, we have to work together, number one, to form bonds to kind of fight against the inevitable preemptive efforts of the, of the federal government now, and to look at each other for best practices. How did you get around this, uh, this or that? Because we can't give in. We've got to fight for the people of our community and do what's right for the people of our uh, community and not get pushed around. And it's a very important principle to stand up for. And so we're going to work together on those efforts. Now let's talk for a few minutes uh, about national policy because yeah. you are on the front line of so many of the most controversial promises and proposals of the president-elect. Welcome has, to Phoenix. Welcome to Phoenix. <laughs> he has said on day one he will rescind DACA. He will rescind DACA on day one. What would the impact of that be on Phoenix? Horrific, horrific. I mean, some of the, some of the most, look, if I were to nominate uh, someone for our renewal award, it'd be some of these DACA students that are killing it. They're leaders in this community, in incredibly impactful leaders. That's talent. That's who I want to lead this city and state into the, the future. And to have these young people who came here as babies or very young people who have done everything that we expect them to do, more than that, they're awesome to be th under threat of deportation, that is as self-defeating a public policy as you could do. Look, I know it makes for a good bumper sticker in certain uh, political communities, et cetera, but as a matter of public policy, as a matter of human policy, uh, it's completely self-defeating and no city would be hurt more by that than Phoenix, Arizona, because we we're blessed to have so many uh, DACA leaders in our community. Beyond DACA, the president is promising accelerated deportation of undocumented Immigrants, how will the city of Phoenix respond within its borders? 
Nothing, business as usual. I mean, we have a great police department. We're not perfect, but we have a new chief of our police department. We have a, a, a department that has recently recognized nationally for the best police community relations, including in our diverse communities as possible. We're always looking in the mirror, asking how we can do uh, better. We've tried to enforce the famous 1070 law in the most humane way uh, possible. If they're going to try to use the purse strings of the federal government to force our officers to be part of some mass deportation uh, unit, we ain't, we're not buying it. We're not going to mm. participate in that, nor should we. That's not smart uh, human policy. It's not smart public safety policy, and it creates distrust between the citizens of the community uh, and the police department. We're not going to play that game. So even if they're talking about cutting off additional uh, various lines of federal funding for cities that don't cooperate with ICE on expanded deportation, you will still say no. That's correct. We're not going to become any mass. We, we've, got a, we've got a good public policy. Now, look, if someone gets arrested yeah. in our city now and gets booked into jail, we have a process in place to examine their, their status and pr provide information to ICE under those uh, circumstances. They want to expand that so that our officers have to go out and effectively become deportation officers. That's not smart public safety policy, uh, and it's not good for the citizens of Phoenix, and it's a principle worth fighting for. And I know myself and many other mayors across the country, we're going to fight for the right thing. Two more quick areas, uh, and then, and then uh, if I have time, I guess I'm not going to go to questions. I'm going to go to the next panel. Uh, two more quick areas. What would building a wall mean for Phoenix? It would be a, a terrible public policy. Look. I mentioned earlier, um, we are the fastest growing export economy in the country. Now, we started out with a low base. We actually won the President's E Award, uh, Exporting Award, only the fifth mm. city in the last 40 years to win that because how far we've advanced in that regard. And Mexico is our number one uh, trading uh, partner. That would be a completely self-defeating uh, public policy. It is a solution in search of a problem. And instead of demonizing our friends in Mexico, we're so blessed to, to be a border state that actually, with a friendly neighbor that we get along with for the most part, uh, we may have an issue here or there, but overall, we get along with uh, uh, Mexico. That's a fast-growing economy there. They're the 12th largest in the world now, and they're growing to be the fifth or sixth largest over the next 30 years. That's economic opportunity, a growing middle class. Let's take advantage of it. Let's not create an adversarial relationship. Let's reach out and see how we can be the best economic partners possible for our mutual benefit, a wall would go in exactly the wrong direction. And, and, and that probably answers my last area, which was the president has said he will substantially renegotiate NAFTA and walk away from it if Mexico will not. The president-elect, let's be clear. President he's elect. not president yet. President uh, he's elect. not president. President-elect. Uh, uh, yeah, look, uh, obviously the trade deals have been very, very uh, controversial. They're not perfect in any regard. But overall, increasing trade between um, Arizona and Mexico is a huge benefit to the Arizona economy. Already almost 100,000 jobs in Arizona, high wage jobs, are directly related to our trade relationship with Mexico. And we're just getting started. So, it, 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 you know, a renegotiation of NAFTA that would add uh, too high of tariffs and slow down that trade opportunity would be bad for the Arizona uh, economy. And I certainly won't be supportive of How that. How tough are the next four years going to be for, for your vision of Phoenix? Well, look, in, uh, look, we're going to overcome those challenges. I mentioned earlier that when they try to preempt us at the state or at the federal government, we're going to fight it. we got a good thing going on here in Phoenix, Arizona. People are moving here. Our economy is moving in the right direction. I believe we're going to make the right choices so that we can become a tier one economy in the United States uh, of America. And we're going to do it despite attempts to interfere with uh, what we've got going on here. Mayor Stanton, thanks for joining us. Good to see us. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.